Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Aaron Braggins, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad to talk about our computer preferences. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED37. All right, so... I'm thinking of this episode, you guys, as kind of like a companion to Second Opinion, where we review, like, specific items, right, specific devices on Second Opinion. Um, But I think it's very useful to kind of think about what are the general rules that we follow when we are evaluating uh, and choosing, like, what computers we're going to buy, right? some of these things are going to be things that like uh, are are like universally applicable that will uh, apply to all different types of computers, all the way from desktops on down to smartphones. Um, other things are going to be a little bit more specific. Some things are going to be specific to like this point in time. Other things are going to be like you know uh, apply across you know all the way from the year two thousand to the year twenty fifty. Um, so, shall we get into it? We shall. Um, oh, by the way, the three of you should probably introduce yourselves so people can hear your voices and associate them with a name. Hi, I'm Ryan. I build computers occasionally. Hi, I'm Brian. I use computers occasionally. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aaron. I also build uh, computers occasionally and use them. Uh, and I'm Ian, and, and I teach computer tech at a high school occasionally. What do we do when we're not occasionally doing these things, I wonder? (laughs) Well, I'm usually just teaching or podcasting, and that's about it. All right, so let's talk about uh, some of our preferences that we have that apply across all different categories of computers. Um, So my, my kind of guiding star when I'm evaluating computer systems is that the software is, is much more important to me than the hardware. Um, cause like if, if I buy some hardware that is tied down to a software platform, then that's, that's it. Like there, I can't, there, there's nothing that can be done, uh, to escape from that. Um, but, uh, if, yeah, if, if I, if I keep in mind like software platforms, that are like open and I can uh, change things around if I want to, um, then then like I can probably find hardware that will work with that. So that's kind of that's the the very, very first thing that I evaluate when I um, am, am looking at something, which is uh, one of the reasons that I definitely disagree with uh, Brian and Aaron on phone choices. <laughs> uh, I, I would never buy an iPhone uh, as long as you know Apple, continues to keep ios like locked down uh in a, in a closed ecosystem i'm curious if you would have bought an iphone back in the early days when there were people having that got linux running on an iphone and jailbreaking was huge and oh it's an open interesting world because i i had i my first iphone was an iphone 4 and that was still in pretty much the heyday of, of jailbreaking and so there was just so much you could do i was you mm-hmm. know linux utilities all over the place um, crazy tweaks and things that I think are atrocious these days, but I thought it was cool then. <laughs> these days, I don't think you can even like plug a mouse into a you know an iPhone and and get a cursor to pop up. Someday, yeah, maybe not. I mean, I I did do that with my old iPhone four. I had a Bluetooth mouse plugged into it or hooked up to it. Quite interesting. Um, device longevity is also something that is important to consider. Um, it is really difficult to know ahead of time, right? Like, oh yeah, this, this new phone that just came out, like, are we going to find out later that it has a bunch of soldering issues on the CPU? Um, speaking from experience with the Nexus 5X, uh, you know, we, we can't, we can't know those kinds of issues ahead of time, but we can work off of the like the um reputation that a company has for things like getting software updates out to a device and um, providing like hardware repair support um 
So, for example, uh, you know, the the essential phone came out. Uh, what was it last year? This year? Sometime? Um, and it, you know, it's it's a very like appealing device on the face of it. it it has stock android they bring out software updates to it very quickly but because essential is a brand new company and we don't know if they're going to you know be around you know you know in the future it's hard to know like whether you're going to be able to get your phone repaired if you have any problems with it um which also brings me to my next point which is uh I, I pay a lot of attention to brands. Um, you know, this isn't. I'm not buying cereal at the at the supermarket, right? I can't afford to uh, buy the cheapest phone that I find. The che- you know, and and uh, then find out later that like, oh, this is actually like a plastic piece of crap and it falls apart in my hands. Um, so I I do put a lot of stock in in branding because uh in the computer world because that's how i know that like a company is going to have my back is if they if if i know that they're going to have systems in place for that kind of thing yeah i've always found like with pc hardware um in the early days uh brands would do kind of like this almost bait and switch thing where they would have a couple cycles where they would have really really good hardware good Mm. good reviews awesome stuff and they'd get that hype train going and people would buy their product and then they would kind of teeter off a little bit and then they'd come back once they uh once they kind of lost some credibility but and this is like early days when like companies like a bit were still around um i have never heard of that yeah they this is like 386 um uh, you know like intel celeron days when like those were the prized after overclocking chips um you know but nowadays it seems like you got the standard name brands like corsair and asus and kind of the core like five or six that are really solid and like you're saying look at like their rmas um if they seem like they're doing a real good job uh stay away from uh companies that kind of have bad reviews uh, and you can find those on forums youtube channels all over the place Mm -hmm. and um if even if a company has like a really good reputation in one area that doesn't mean that they're going to do everything well right um my like msi uh is a very well-known graphics card brand uh but then when we were looking for a gaming laptop for my brother you know i found an msi laptop that had fantastic specs uh for for the price that it was being offered for and it was from msi and i was like oh yeah let's do it and it was uh made of plastic and uh was terrible and it took us like a year and a half to figure out that it had a bad sector of ram that we needed to replace and Mm. (laughs) yeah so that was an adventure that um I hope that our listeners can learn from (laughs) (laughs) don't game on a laptop that's that's a good advice that's another very good lesson (laughs) yes (laughs) i mean you're it's a trade-off if you want a gaming laptop you're gonna get something that's big or you're gonna probably spend a lot of money on something that's built comparable to like uh apple laptop in the razor brand right um Mm -hmm. it's like a almost close to a three or four thousand dollar computer but it's built really well even then when we're talking about gaming laptops right they're not going to be as future proof as like a desktop of equivalent uh ability um yeah. desktops are just going to retain their their ability to perform for longer um yeah. Yeah, and you can replace components in a desktop computer when they age, mm-hmm. right? Yep, yep. Um, so since we're since we're talking about desktops right now, um, I would like to highlight a very helpful resource uh, is PCPartPicker.com. A great website to go to if you are uh, trying to figure out what components you're going to put in your computer because it will um, it it will basically warn you if you're trying to put together different components that aren't compatible um and and that allows you to do a lot of this without having the deep knowledge of like oh yeah right the the um 
Intel i5 from you know the 8000 line is going to have this particular socket type and so I have to find a motherboard that is compatible with that and then I have to find the RAM that's compatible with that just use PC part picker and it'll like you know only give you the option of putting stuff together that is uh, um, compatible with each other yeah it's a really nice tool for someone who's kind of a novice where they they're like oh I have this part or my my buddy gave me this part you can kind of plug it in and then build a computer around that or build what you have Mm -hmm. there. Uh, So let's say you got a bunch of parts, you throw them in there, see if they're going to work together before you Mm -hmm. even like try to put something together and you can float links to other people. So you can be like, Hey, check this build out. You know, it, do you think, you know, what could I do? Could I get a better CPU, better graphics card, you know, that type of thing and kind of collaborate. Mm-hmm. There's a subreddit out there that is kind of built around, I forget what it's called, it's been years since I've looked on it, but where you basically link PC part picker lists and say what kind of what you're looking to spend and what you're looking to get out of the computer and just you're just swamped with people commenting saying, do this, do that, and it, you can save a lot of money or have a, a mm-hmm. fine computer. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like most of us here are uh, in the building a a desktop is better than buying a desktop camp yeah i would say so i i i'm depends on my needs depends on what uh what my intended use of the computer is um Mm -hmm. you know and and this may be coming with age but like the idea of getting a older cpu an older uh whole computer like a refurb computer and then throwing in like a really good graphics card and then maybe a SSD or upgrading the RAM just to save some money because I know where I can skimp. Um, mm-hmm. I kind of like that idea. One of Ryan and I's coworkers just did that exact thing. He bought like a i7 for 250 bucks, full refurbished computer with an i7 and then just threw, a vid- threw his old video card in it and he's playing his games just going to town and you i mean you can't even buy an operating system for under a hundred dollars you can't buy the cpu for that price you know Mm -hmm. so yeah it's a good idea one of one of the cautions of course is that when you buy used computers you don't really know what it's been used for or where it's been and what conditions Mm -hmm. so it's like a used car yeah and so it's it, it, it it very well may save a lot of money and that's great but it also can be sort of a waste of money if it isn't a good buy and also you sort of have to trouble troubleshoot on your own you don't know a lot of things going into it and so you have to be able to handle a lot of other situations on top of it yeah yeah that that is definitely one of the advantages of buying a brand new computer from a a well-known brand is that you know if there's something that goes wrong with it you you can just send it to them and they will fix it and you know send it back um whereas you know if you're if you're building a computer like for one thing you have to have the knowledge to be able to put the computer together on your own um i i tend to like building a computer uh partially for the reason that like when i once i've built a computer right i know exactly how all of the components go together in this build um and and so i know that i can take it apart again and troubleshoot it and figure out what's wrong with it um and you know so that's yeah it's it's kind of up to you to figure out whether you want to go to that effort yourself um or if you want to have another company, you know, deal with it on your behalf. Um, and in general, you have to, you know, you're going to be paying for that service yep. one way or another. I'm also a proponent of building because you, you learn, right? You learn about yeah, you know, what pieces go together. You just learn a skill, right? And then you can pass mm-hmm. that on to someone, you know, and you can save a lot of money building your own computers. I would say even, um, you know, buying a used computer or refurbished and then changing a part is still kind of falling under the built a PC, especially if you're buying a used PC that someone else built, the components are assembled in a way, you know, versus you buying a used Dell workstation that is all stock parts. Right. And, and one of the, one of the risks of like 
planning on buying a used computer or, or you know buying a mostly built computer and then like adding in your own components is it's hard to know exactly how easy it's going to be to open that thing up and like get at all of the components and fit new stuff in um yeah whereas yeah if, if you're buying a case uh then you know you you can control the entire thing from one end to the other uh on you know how much space you're giving yourself inside the physical computer yeah yeah that the the idea of buying a refurbished computer i would say is probably more of a uh advanced user because the our co-worker is uh, is nerdy like us right he knows what he was getting into because one of the benefits of uh building your computer is you can buy generic parts um where it's uh it's not generic it's got a name brand but the sizes are generic, right? They're designed to go together where you get someone like Dell or HP or Gateway for some of us older folks, they build stuff with what, like a proprietary form factor. So you have to buy their parts, which that is a bad thing. It's extremely Mm -hmm. frustrating to upgrade uh, OEM desktops and computers um, for that very reason. What's OEM? I don't know, Ian. What's OEM? That stands for Original Something Manufacturer. Equipment. Original Equipment Manufacturer? Okay, yeah. yeah. So basically, so. any of the large computer vendors, um, sort of sort of as uh, white label products, we, we generally f- refer to those as OEM vendors. Mm-hmm. Historical reasons. I don't know if there are modern reasons or not. One of the big challenges, I think, for somebody who is just starting off uh, with building a computer is, and and this applies not just to building a desktop, but also to like picking out a laptop, um, is getting components that are are like well balanced against each other. Right? It would be totally, totally possible to uh, like max out your budget on uh you know a really beefy cpu a huge motherboard that costs 300 dollars, and then you get yourself a graphics card that costs like you know a hundred dollars and you know i would look at that build and immediately go well that's ridiculous right um but like if, if you don't know kind of what's normal uh then then you won't realize that like oh that that graphics card should cost roughly twice as much as the processor that you're putting in there in order for them to kind of be comparable uh and so yeah i i in general these are really general numbers um but i usually go for like a motherboard that costs about 10 percent of my total total uh, budget uh cpu would be about like 20 percent ram would be about 10 percent a gpu would be about 40 percent um and then storage i mean storage can fluctuate a lot depending on how much storage you want but uh i would usually go for about 20 percent um and then the rest of the budget would go to yeah like other components um peripherals stuff like that yeah i think that's a a good breakdown um one thing for me when i'm looking uh you can kind of judge the the price point of a CPU until you get to like the high, high end, like the flagship stuff, but you can judge your CPU and your, uh, like your graphics card should probably be around double the price of your CPU. At least that's how I go. Unless you Mm -hmm. want to go crazy and add more, more than one card. Um, right. But it's, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, if you're going to have two cards, think about one card because the hassle you know, spend more on that one card because the hassle of two cards, uh, two video cards, and just debugging all that stuff gets mm-hmm. to be not worth it sometimes. Yeah, I I have come to value stability in my computer builds a heck of a lot more than I did when I was in high school or early college. And nowadays, I just want a computer that'll work and will continue to work for many years. Yep. Um, I think Brian has some experience with that kind of thing. Yeah, so uh, in college, it was 2013 that fall, I built a Hackintosh. So it was a gigabyte What's a Hackintosh? It is a PC you build that you get running macOS, or at the time, OS X. 
So uh, generally, I think Gigabyte motherboards have the best support for Mac OS power management, Intel CPU. You can do AMD or NVIDIA graphics cards depending on which generation. And then everything else is kind of standard. You know, whatever RAM power supply case doesn't really matter. Um, I spent about $80 more on my CPU than I did my GPU. But just to throw a different thing into your guys' thing. I, well, I got the the i7, which I think was 330 And then I got, a at the time, a GTX 760, which was 250 Huh. So that's what I'm still rocking today with, with my Hackintosh. But when, when you do build on your own, that you know, support isn't there, especially with a Hackintosh. Um, we recorded a pod kit, I don't know, sometime last year, I think. And uh, we were like half an hour in and the thing crashed, lost all the audio. We had to re-record. So now I've been recording on my six-year-old MacBook Pro ever since that happened. <laughs> and I'm looking for more stability. I want fewer wires. Um, I'm basically going all in on an iMac here shortly, which is which is uh, kind of the opposite of what you said earlier. Uh, your preference being building versus buying. Um, you're definitely buying an iMac. You, you can't build yes. one. Yes. Okay. I should prefix that saying if it's Windows, yes, build. <laughs> He's configuring um, a, a Mac. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Build He's to order. building it in his cart. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> building in my cart, exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. I remember the days in high school when I would just like go to Alienware's website and just like trick out, you know, the highest end laptop that I could and just drool at the screen. That is what um, I did in like sixth grade and junior high before I got <laughs> my MacBook. Ugh. And I would just spend hours and hours reading Wikipedia on all the Macs. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredible. And watching old keynotes. Oh, man. I have, I was the coolest kid. Life was so much simpler before I had like money of my own. <laughs> yes, you just dream. So should we talk about the difference between uh, Ma- uh, Apple's philosophy versus uh, I'm going to say a Windows computer, but like uh, like one thing you can't do with a Macintosh is actually build one. You at one point in time there was some Macintosh clones. Five star. Mm. But dark, yes. dark era for Apple. But like for me, I want to build a Hackintosh because I don't necessarily want to be prescribed what I can have in a desktop. Um, I want to be able to put a really stupid, expensive graphics card in it because I want to play games. Right. Mm-hmm. So like that's the downfall to Apple, uh, in my opinion, is I. I'm beholden to them about what I can do or what I can't do. Yeah, I, in terms of the the Windows versus Mac um, argument, I I think that the two operating systems are are pretty comparable in on most of like the kind of higher order questions that we can ask, like. Are they open operating systems? Yes, you can. You know, you can install software from anywhere on both of them. Um, not Windows S. It, okay, well, that's not. Yeah, sure. Is that even um, Windows? <laughs> it's, I would not True. categorize that as Windows. Um, like Windows does do. Like Microsoft has has put in a lot of effort into uh, ensuring that there is driver support for basically every piece of hardware on the planet for their operating system. Um, and the more that I start to, the, the more that I have come to terms with like the problems that Android has had with, with their uh, update cycles, uh, the more I appreciate like, wow, how did Microsoft even manage to put this together? Um, yeah, it, I, I think that for the most part, like choosing between windows and mac os is going to come down to like what are your what what is your preference for like the user interface um and then like some really specific questions like are the games that you want to play available for the operating system yep do you need to have a unix terminal um yes if yeah like so so like really specific questions like that that are going to differ from user to user i think are the, are the 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 main differentiators for for Mac or Windows, mm-hmm. and I mean, it doesn't matter. But I'm personally on the Windows side of things. <laughs> <laughs> really? Mo- mostly because that's how I grew up, uh, and also that's where my games library is. So sure, I converted my whole family from Dell 
and Windows to Macintosh. Um, I don't really know. Well, it was me in junior high. I liked playing with GarageBand. That's pretty much what did it for me. It's all it took. It's all it took. <laughs> I, I think I would personally really like to make the switch over to some flavor of Linux. Um, the main thing that is holding me back is, yeah, the, the game's library issue. Um, <laughs> which is, which is, you know, it's, it's, that's not really Apple's fault, nor is it Linux's fault. Uh, I think it's just that like windows has such a large market share that, and, and, you know, games development takes so much, so many resources that it's just not cost effective for, for game developers to come out with their games for anything other than like windows and consoles quite often. Yeah. Um, so yeah i'm very happy i am not really a a big gamer so i don't really care if my computer is good or not at gaming (laughs) it really takes a lot of the difficulties about deciding what to buy out of it yeah and like i really the games i play now i haven't played like desktop minecraft in over a year but that runs on my six-year-old macbook pro so does (laughs) age of empires 3 and age of mythology which are both from the early 2000s so and that just runs in wine. So yes, they don't work on Mac OS or Linux natively, but they also don't That's very really, true. they hardly yeah. run on windows natively either. So true. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. In a ver- modern version of windows, you're probably doing an emulation of like windows 2000 or something in order to get, uh, older games to work anyway. So exactly. Fantastic. Let's uh, let's talk about laptops. Um, yeah. What what are your guys' uh, preferences here? I think a laptop really needs to have a strong case and form factor, um, and I think this is a reason why I really like the Apple MacBooks. They're I think they're another level beyond most of the PC hardware you see out there. Um, they I think the unibody design is something Apple really has nailed in the last you know ten years. Um, so a, a strong case. I would I would almost if I had to run Windows buy a Mac and put Windows on it just because I think it's that good. I don't think you should pollute your good computer with that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll buy a second Mac just to have that run Windows. There you go. Oh. There. <laughs> <laughs> this it's like my my two phone situation right now, right? Yeah. Just <laughs> there are some PCs out there that are actually unibody design. I think uh one of our coworkers just got a Huawei. Uh, yeah, the MateBook. Yeah, yeah, the MateBook. And yeah, I mean, I've been hearing great things about that. There are some. There are some competitors. It's got a glossy screen, so it's not that great. It's but, not that good, but it's almost good. <laughs> it, now, Ryan, I think you're. Uh, forget what maker it is. Which one is it? Your your aluminum Windows computer. I have no idea. You got it a year oh, or two ago. Oh, sure. Yeah. So. Uh, HP has this line of Envy computers. The Envy line is sort of a, a line they kind of brought back uh, and turned into the Spectre line of computers. And so they, they kind of intermingle those two lineups uh, a little bit too much to actually keep it straight anymore. But yeah, it was it was sort of like, it wasn't like a hard aluminum like a MacBook Pro is. It was sort of a more plasticky aluminum, if that makes any sense. Okay. From what I remember, that seemed like a pretty strong, durable computer. It was I think, okay. I think the Windows Surface line, at least for my limited exposure, seems strong enough in terms of the, the case design. I think a, a metal case just brings a lot more durability and quality to a computer. On the other hand, uh, I did have one time in high school where uh, my old Dell Latitude laptop big chunky brick right made of made of hard plastic uh collided with a macbook pro and the macbook pro had a dent in its soft aluminum um you couldn't even tell on the dell that it had hit anything yeah so so, sometimes metal is is better sometimes plastic is better really probably the what the monstrous steel frame inside of that dell computer (laughs) (laughs) oh man so that that is one thing that i i made I have made a few mistakes in in the laptop realm uh, that I would like people to learn from. Is uh, yeah, s- specs are not as important in the laptop space as they are in the desktop space. Um, the form factor is definitely 
a huge, huge factor. And I did not appreciate that for a long time. Um, like that, the, the laptop that I had when I was a kid was huge. It probably, you know, I probably wouldn't need to see a chiropractor right now if I hadn't been lugging that thing around when I was, uh, you know, when I was growing. Um, it's, uh, it's really difficult to know just by looking at like a product sheet, like whether the keyboard and trackpad are going to feel good when you're using it, right? Um, so that's why I put a lot of stock into like, you know, in-depth reviews. Um, and and uh, and the other reason that I don't really pay as much attention to the specs of a laptop is is what we were talking about earlier, um, that like. A desktop is just going to last so much longer than a laptop, no matter how powerful the laptop is right now. And so, like, since I know that my laptop isn't going to remain powerful, like, why even try? Um, so that's going that's, all in, I would say. Maybe yeah, because I'm, little, I'm not going to spend a... $3,000 in order to have a laptop that is going to remain powerful in the future. Um, I would rather have one that what? just like meets I my needs. That. I mean, and... why wouldn't you want to ha- buy a $3,000 laptop and actually have it be good for five years? I mean, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no. So what I would rather do is uh, buy a laptop that's like, I don't know, 800 to a dollars maybe 1200 if I'm feeling wild, right? Um and and just like bring my expectations back, right? I have a desktop at, at home. It's okay. I can use the desktop for things that I really really need, like high performance computing for. What it's if you okay need that the laptop mobile can't high do all those things. I, just just get over it. Don't don't <laughs> need that. <laughs> Hold on, Ian. I'm gonna um, tell you to get over all your storage. Like like okay. I can understand if you are a software developer and you need to like you know run the software that you are you know like the code that you're programming uh, and and have that perform uh, at a high level like no matter what coffee shop you happen to be working in. Um, but like you know for me the the most intensive thing that I do is uh, exporting FLAC files out of Audacity um, and. You know, I just I I have uh, that's going to be slow that, anywhere. Well, to be yes, fair, exactly. <laughs> it is far more intensive to export MP3 out of Audacity. Yes, that's very true. Um, but yeah, so so nowadays I I take a look at like almost the first thing I think that I look at is like, all right, does this laptop have like a nice flat chiclet keyboard? Um, does it have a multi touch trackpad? That used to be a huge huge thing that you you know like. Max had really good uh, key, uh, trackpads for the long time. Um, then all of a sudden, like Chromebooks, uh, starting in like 2011, 2012, had really, really good trackpads. Um, Windows laptops for the longest time, it was like, you don't know if you're going to get a good trackpad or not. Um, nowadays, I think for the most part, like most most laptops have pretty good trackpads. Sometimes you'll find ones that don't, but like, um, yeah. I don't know. I still hear and read and experience bad laptop trackpads regularly. I have yet to use a a PC trackpad that is that feels as good as an Apple one. I agree. I would agree with that. You know what? I just realized I don't remember the last time that I like used a Windows laptop for an extensive amount of time. Yeah, they're not. They're they're pretty rare these days. I'm also. An enthusiast for USB-C. So at this point in 2018, I I would not buy a laptop that doesn't charge via USB-C. Um, that's something that is pretty specific to right now in time. Um, but hopefully, you know, if the USB-C spec sticks around for a long time, um, that'll that'll remain the case. Um, we need to get you on the Thunderbolt three train. And yeah, like like. My my reasoning for that is that I, I, at the core, I just want to be able to charge all of my devices off of just one type of cord. Um, it would also be really nice, like it would be a bonus if I could use the same adapters for like my phone that I as as I use on my laptop, right? So I can plug either device into an external display or whatever. Um, yeah, so that future that you uh, are talking about would be nice. It would, yeah. Um, I mean, we're not there yet. We seem to be really messing up the path to that future. <laughs> yeah, we are. 
I think it's an interesting design too. I think we've talked about this on some other podcasts, but you know, the USB power delivery spec supports, you know, anywhere from what, like five Watts to a hundred. Mm-hmm. And you, if your hard, if every single USB C connector had to support 100 Watts, things would be so expensive and extremely large and no one would use right. it at all. So, Right, which is why I would just, you know, like have my laptop's charger with me and then, oh, look, that also charges my phone, you know, so there you go. I can do charge either one. Um, and yeah, actually, speaking of USB-C, I believe that we covered that uh, on extensively on a previous episode of The Extra Dimension, uh, something like two years ago. Yeah, uh, that sounds I'll, right. I'll put a link. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Um, how do you guys feel about laptops that are like you know the the hybrid tablet laptop things that like flip all the way around and have touch screens and stuff? They don't run macOS, so they don't they do not exist to me. <laughs> uh, so I, I I have experience with that. So uh, as Brian mentioned earlier, I did have this rogue Windows laptop running around here at some point. And it was one of those two-in-one type of laptops. So you could flip it all the way around and use it sort of as a tablet. You could flip it mostly around and use it sort of as a, a tent when it's raining. Oh, wait, I mean, mm-hmm. um, it would be self-propping, which is kind of cool. Um, but but as Brian mentioned, it wasn't running an actual operating system for work. It was running an operating system for something that isn't work. Um, and while the touchscreen is super cool and I would love for a Mac to have one, um, because, uh, that'd be, it could be convenient at times. Um, it's not that impressive to me and I don't really know when it's useful. Yeah. Um, the, the most useful cases that I have seen for a, a touchscreen on a traditional like desktop environment was, um, my fiance does like digital art, right? And so we bought her a Surface, uh, a Surface Pro Four, and um, you know we figured out like some some third party software to install on it that would make it much easier to like use it, use the stylus on you know in uh, Photoshop or whatever. Uh, does she use GIMP? I don't. Whatever you know, illustration program she uses, right? Um, but also having like these nice big on-screen uh buttons for just like undo redo you know like the the buttons that you'd expect to see on a drawing tablet um the difference being of course that the like the the strokes that you're that you're making on the screen the art is actually appearing right there where your tablet or where your stylus is um which i think makes a huge huge difference uh as opposed to like drawing on a tablet that is uh, on your desk and then seeing the result up on a screen on your on your desktop computer um, that's one case where I think that that a touchscreen uh, laptop is really useful the other usage case is um, if the operating system in question actually allows you to like run mobile apps um, which is the case on Chromebooks these days um, my brother has the uh, the Samsung Chromebook plus v2 uh, which we reviewed just last week on second opinion go listen to that uh and yeah he's he's really liking having the option of like either using the web version of the services that he uses or the android app version depending on which one is going to be to be better um and of course you can use the android apps with like a trackpad and mouse but it just, you know, it, it makes so much more sense quite often to use the touchscreen. So, yeah, yeah. In, in the case of the mobile apps, that, that is a great point. It makes a lot of sense there. Um, I haven't used a Chromebook in a while, but uh, that's, that is a very appealing kind of device and especially a means of interacting with it. Shall we talk about tablets? Sure. What are tablets, Ian? <laughs> well, they're kind of like big phones, except that like now phones are just as big as tablets. So, uh, yeah. Wait, what are tablets? <laughs> they're they're little, more stripped down two in ones. Well, yeah. So, yep. so they're like laptops that aren't as good. Yeah. Um, I I just realized that I've only ever really owned one category of tablet, and that is like a seven inch or eight inch 
Android tablet. Um, I had the Nexus 7 back in the day. I had the Nexus 7 Generation 2, and I have the NVIDIA Shield tablet currently. I think you had a dozen Nexus 7s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <And> then- <laughs> I remember seeing you carry that around in college, like it, like in your pocket of your pants, yes, because that correct. was your phone. Mm-hmm. Crazy times. Yeah, because I, I couldn't afford to have an actual phone plan at the time and so uh, I just wanted you know a, a, a mobile device that cost a few hundred dollars and um, yeah back in 2012 like there weren't really any phones that were available at that price point that were worth it that were so, any good at all even close yeah so so I got myself a seven inch tablet and stuck it in my front pocket because back then I also wore very very baggy pants <laughs> And uh, and it fit in there. <laughs> the only problem is that like since it was so gigantic, I I dropped it uh, several times. <laughs> several times. And yeah, so I went through several different copies of the Nexus Seven. <laughs> I can go get the box from you from the other room. <laughs> but yeah, no, I I really like the like that form factor, the seven or eight inch tablet as just kind of like this this reading device. Um, it's, it's just about the perfect size to like read a book in bed or um, read some comic books, right? Um, I, when, I, when I'm like reading comiXology on my phone, right? I have to have it zoom into each individual panel on the page. Um, but when you're using like an eight inch tablet, that's about the same physical size as like a page in a comic book. And, uh, and so that works out perfectly. Um, I just, yeah, I, I use it as kind of like a companion media consumption device to my phone right i'll like load some games onto the tablet that i don't necessarily need to like take up the storage on the phone for um if i'm going to go on like a flight or a long car drive right i'll download a few extra like videos and stuff onto the tablet so i can just watch them on a larger screen and save my phone's battery um i don't i don't really believe in the ipad pro approach which is like oh this is a giant tablet it can have a keyboard and it can be a laptop replacer um i need a i need a real laptop i agree come at me aaron <laughs> no i i'm not gonna come at you because i i use my i use my tablet for that same you know the same thing it's it's my house computer it travels around um i load up recipes i go cook or i run out to the garage i have tutorial videos if i'm trying to do something i just see like that type of device as like the replacement and i know we're not there yet because as ryan is going to say i can't i can't build my next os on (laughs) an ipad yet which i agree that's my criteria for for future computing yeah (laughs) which i think is good and it's very valid right uh but so I'll, i'll tell you my perspective on this so i have an ipad pro that's just sitting upstairs. It's never been out of the house. It's really never been out of the living room. What does it do? It doesn't do anything. I have a phone that's like 20 feet long here, I think. So that is a great reading device. I have a laptop here. I have a laptop upstairs. I have desktops over there. I have desktops over here. Uh, there's computers all over the place. There's no role for me to have a slightly bigger glass box thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but have you, yeah. have you ever tried to sit in a hammock? holding a laptop, trying to just relax and read a book (laughs) with a laptop. I don't do any of those things. I was going to say, I would like to see Ryan doing that. Relaxing? (laughs) I agree. Me too. Well, Uh, in a a hammock with a a laptop. uh, Actually, I I have not done that. So... You know, so I think what's cool about uh, like the the iPad Pro approach of of kind of turning into the... uh, laptop replacement is that it could do it if it actually had an operating system that allowed it to do it but right now it's sort of in this odd place where there's a computer type that lets you do it sort of the surface pro model where it's a free computer system you can do whatever you need to do but then the interfaces aren't quite as optimized and they're sort of anything goes um because how many apps are there really on windows that make any use of the tablet nature (laughs) and the two-in-one nature not very many, but on the iPad, far, few and far between. Yeah. On the other hand, the iPad has apps all over the place. They can make use of the pencil. They can make use of the touch screen because that's what it was designed for, and that's what it excels at. So it's it's in an interesting place. Uh, but on the other hand, 
the iPad is really just a worse OS X device. And I know I called it OS X. I mean OS X. Yeah. No. So the other thing, though, like the iPad, uh, I look at it as um, something to replace computers for as as Apple's pushing it normal people. Yeah. Um, like, I think that's what we're pushing it for. Right. Like, if you're checking email, surfing the web, like, I used an iPad when I traveled uh, abroad, and I was like, oh, I'm going to need... I'm going to need my computer because I'm going to want to upload photos and I want, I'm going to want to do all this stuff. And it's like, well, wait, pair back, travel a lot lighter than you normally would. And I ended up using my iPad and my phone just to do everything I would, would have done with the laptop. So did you um, still upload photos with your iPad? Uh, I transferred video from my GoPro to my iPad, um, mm. which you have to you know, yeah, buy adapters and whatnot. But that was the biggest thing. Yeah. All my photos basically went to iCloud, right? Mm-hmm. So I uh we used our data plan, so I didn't really do a lot of uploading. Yeah. So I, I I have not typically gone on vacations with computers because that's kind of my point of not like that's how you go on vacation, I think. Pretty sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> not not used to it though. Um but but so for me, like I wouldn't take the iPad if I were to need a computer. I would just have a smaller laptop because the iPad is so constrained. Web browsing on the iPad for me is, it's like nails on a chalkboard. I mean, you can barely have a tab open before you need to have another 50 tabs open. Wait a second. Maybe I'm doing tabs wrong. <laughs> huh. What I always do when I go on vacation is uh, I end up doing a lot of like reading books for research for the extra dimension episode <laughs> you're doing it wrong yeah, it's supposed to be a I'm vacation. Doing it so wrong <laughs> we appreciate your dedication ian oh thank you thank you but are these um, like um, physical books or are you reading oh hell no like, no, no 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 e- <laughs> e-books okay. all the way oh, okay. <laughs> so so before we move on from tablets where do you think tablets mm-hmm. are going so like there's kind of kind of this point where the Windows side wanted to become more like a iPad, and there's sort of this point where the iPad side and then they becomes failed. more like uh, a real computer. So where 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 does the tablet go and, from and here? Android is just like walking around, bumping into trees over there in the background. Um, yeah, yeah. So the- I think um, so. I've I've had I had an iPad Mini two, which is the first Retina display one. That was great. Um, I used it in school to take notes on, which is fine on all those tiny little desks in like an auditorium. Um, I got an iPad Pro 9.7 inch last spring or like of 2017, so a year and a half ago. Um, and I found that's much more of a comfortable size. So the 9.7.9 to 9.7 inch. Um, and iOS has gotten more featured in that in that time as well, as in addition to the iPad Pro being more powerful and can use some of those new features like multiple apps at the same time. Um, additional things like the share sheets were added since I had my iPad mini um, now with drag and drop. I think the operating system, at least for iOS, is getting better and better. Um, and there are definitely some more power users who can get by with just an iPad. I find that an iPad does pretty much all I could want it to, um, You know, aside from like web development or something, which clearly is going to be better on a computer. But <laughs> I I mostly use my iPad for catching up on Twitter, sitting on the couch, or watching YouTube, um, or reading articles. It's and that's about it. Sometimes I'll play some games, but that's usually more on my phone. Um, I and you know I have there's some great apps for like writing Markdown. Some so I've written a few blog posts for my website over the years on an iPad. Um, there's there's really an app for most things on that iPad. You just have to kind of know where to find it and think think about interacting with multiple different apps in a different way than you would on a computer but i have i've felt pretty comfortable with it and i've i've used it solely for taking notes for an entire semester um so i had all my textbooks and notes on there nothing physical um i've used it to plan lighting for lighting design for theater um you know drawn plots on on it and everything so do you i use, think it's a good device did you use the pencil to do the plotting and stuff or i should have oh. <laughs> i use my finger okay i'm pretty happy with like tablets just being treated as like a a 
consumption device rather than a creation device. Um, I think they fit pretty well into that into that space. Um, you know, I like despite the fact that the um, the Nvidia Shield tablet that I have is you know woefully uh, underpowered, especially in like the the uh, storage department. I made the mistake of getting a 16 gigabyte one. Um, you know, I'll, I'll still be using it for a very, very long time because, like, it doesn't take that much storage to have some books on there and, you know, store a bunch of articles on Pocket. Um, and that being said, uh, I think when it comes time to replace that device, I probably won't be replacing it with another 8-inch tablet. I will probably end up replacing it with some sort of hybrid like right now it's looking like a chromebook you know a small 11 inch or so chromebook um that i can run my android apps on and uh and and you know then you'll get to see me uh laying on a hammock reading a book with this tent um laptop that's been flipped inside out no i'm going to be holding it with the keyboard facing away from me because you know that's where the keyboard goes when (laughs) when the screen's facing towards you yeah i think that's the best compromise there especially on the android side because as far as i can tell the only android tablets that really get released now are from samsung yeah Yep. And like the 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 big problem, like Apple has done a fantastic job of encouraging app development for the screen size of the iPad, right? Um and on on the Android side, we briefly had, you know, Google pushing like, "Oh yeah, make a make an app like like Gmail where we've got, you know, you can have like multiple columns in the app um depending on like, you know, what your screen size is." And then they completely abandoned that and we don't you know you're basically just using a bunch of um apps that are that that are single you know single column built for a phone just you know being displayed on a larger screen um sounds like twitter on ipad yeah Yeah. so (laughs) so there it is a slightly different like approach you know when you've got an app on on ios that isn't optimized for a large screen it becomes like literally a zoomed in version of like this pixel, you know, emulated uh iPhone app, but on on Android it is like displayed at the resolution of your screen. It's just like, you know, <laughs> like th- the items are just like much much larger um than normal. I will say I think the iPads are good, at least the iPad Pro is a good creation device for drawing and art. Um the yeah. the 10.5 inch and I think the 13 inch pro have 120 hertz displays so they're super responsive and combine that with a pencil and you're spending half as much money as a wacom tablet mm. with the extra bonus that you see what you're drawing immediately underneath your pencil and mm-hmm. i have a friend who's who's been drawing comics for several years and i was talking to him a few months ago and he's saying the ipad is really his his favorite device to draw on and he's the most efficient with it yeah. Hey, let's talk about those miniature tablets. I mean, phones. You mean like this one right here? Yeah, that, I mean, you are definitely currently holding a phone that straddles the line between phone and tablet, which some people like to call phablet, but I hate that. Good, because apparently that's a max. Um, Ha, that was good, huh? (laughs) Timely, isn't it? So I will begin the phone section because I buy a lot of phones. All of them, I guess. No, that's a joke. Uh, it's a joke that I buy three phones a year. It, that's just the you record. Are, I think you are averaging like two and a half per year for the last few years. Yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> what are you buying? The iPhone XX Max or whatever it is? Um, let's also not talk about that yet. So I've been on um, this phone buying spree for the past couple of years because um, I don't I don't know, I don't buy a whole lot of uh, electronics these days, but phones are easy enough to kind of swap between. Um, but I've been mostly on Android, and that's kind of for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, once you kind of get into an ecosystem, there's integration with services, there's some app stickiness. Um, but I also enjoy some of the um, hardware differences and quality uh, of those features. Um, so, for example, my one of my favorite features on the phones that I keep buying a lot of these days are these. Um, I don't know what what is this called now. It's it's ambient display somewhere, but I think it's always on display on this phone. 
but it's, yeah. but the idea is that there's kind of this always on clock and I don't have a watch so this is amazing like this one feature sets apart an entire generation of phones and an entire ecosystem of phones uh, but there's just just other things on Android that I happen to like better for example I can arrange my icons where I want them <laughs> I can't do that on my iPad which is absurd I used to be able to do that when I jailbroke well, that's good. I'm so glad that How I have to. How many years ago was that? <laughs> uh, I think I did it as most recently as iOS 8.4. Yeah. So, so there, I think there's there's a lot of reasons to still like Android. Um, now there are reasons to li- dislike Android. There's insane pri- privacy leakage. I mean, just it's at every turn, at every corner, <laughs> at every GPS coordinate step. Google gets called and it's told exactly where you are and what you're looking at. Um, that's cool. I guess I live with it because I keep using it. But there is some appeal to not have to deal with that. Although I'd still do it probably. Yeah, and and I I totally understand if that's a you know somebody's concern that like okay maybe you don't want to use Android if you if you really uh, are worried about that. Um, I consider it a feature that my phone always knows exactly where I am and that Google always knows exactly where I am because th- they take that they, that information and then give it back to me in a very useful way. Totally. Right? Um, like, like all of the photos that I take on my DSLR, which does not have a GPS uh, plugged into it, I, it doesn't matter that they don't have location data directly on them because like Google knows where I was when I took those pictures. So it just puts two and two together and then those photos are, are sorted into the correct locations. Absolutely. My, my, my yeah. dream, of course, is that all of this is either handled on my own server, encrypted on somebody else's yeah. server, or just directly on the phone. Of course, none of those things happen with my current setup. Um, but, you know, since we're talking about what things we look for, I look for... Um, the latest phone. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, no, no. I mean, I guess I look for some for some things. So, screen quality is important. Um, the ability to actually not fall apart and have soldering issues and power button issues; those are kind of important. Um, <laughs> I, 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 excuse me, are you disparaging my Nexus Five and Nexus Five Xs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. Which I, I, one of those phones I didn't own because it was so bad. Um, so previously the Pixel 2 came out, uh, the Pixel 2 looked awful, but the Pixel 2 XL looked good, but it had an awful screen, so I didn't buy it. Um, even though the Pixel 2 has what is said to be the best camera on the market in a smartphone, at least on the Android side, it doesn't matter because the phone itself is, is, is priced absurdly for the relative specs that it has. So, I mean, it's, it's a weird balancing act with these, uh, phones, also, it's amusing now that all of the phones have suddenly price crept their way up to a thousand dollars, and I don't know oh, how we—I so don't know how we're supposed to feel about that. I'm I'm very angry. I was so happy when I could buy a, a really good phone for like four hundred dollars, uh, and now can't do that. I have been I have been price crept up to a staggering six hundred. Whoa, that's where everybody yeah. else started. <laughs> <laughs> I, I so I'm uh, definitely an, you know like everything an Apple user for smartphones. So when I have to, or when I decide to buy a new iPhone, I really don't have that many options. So it's kind of whatever makes sense at the time, and that's usually the latest phone model. You know, many years ago there was only one new iPhone a year. Um, since then I've gotten the smaller of the latest, and now I'm going with the largest of the latest. Oh, so yeah. I'll be buying a 10s Max in approximately four hours and 32 minutes but (laughs) um yeah i mean i've i've been on iphone since iphone 4 i had a 4 5 6 7 and now soon 10s max so and yeah i i I try to buy those unlocked because i generally do when i travel internationally if i'm somewhere for more than a few days buy a sim card and get data abroad and so being unlocked is important for when, I, when i when i even tra- travel domestically i buy another sim card <laughs> <laughs> that's next level <laughs> oh my gosh uh, oh my gosh yeah i remember when i came over to your house and you had what two samsung galaxy s8s because like one s8 yeah, one you s9 had, you had one on on t-mobile and one on verizon yep, you got it you're ridiculous <laughs> nah, yeah. not at all 
Yeah, I um yeah, I I think that having an unlocked phone is extremely important because um like for one thing there's the yeah, like traveling internationally being able, like not being tied to a carrier if you, you know, find a better deal and you want to switch. Um but also like it it does wonders for the longevity of the device for the resale ability of the device if it's unlocked right um Mm -hmm. i will never like so so i'm always kind of on the lookout for like you know secondhand phones that i can buy for my friends for like my siblings who just need a you know a phone that's a few hundred dollars um I will never ever buy a phone that came from Verizon from anybody because there's no way for me to do anything with it. You know, yep. other like it 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 becomes a Wi-Fi tablet because like my my siblings can't afford to use uh to be on Verizon. There's no way for me to unlock the phone and get it, you know, on, on any other carrier. Now to um, be fair, there are very very affordable prepaid Verizon plans now. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um there's also, I take this unlocked concept further than just like the carrier unlock, but I also, I need to have an unlocked bootloader, um, which is, uh, goes into the software update issue, um, which is a very, very difficult thing to, to uh, address on the Android side. Um, you know, un- typically, if you want to have like software updates for a long time and get those software updates in a timely manner, you're going to be buying either a phone directly from Google um, or like, I guess Essential Phone did, uh, did a really good job with that, but who knows how long around uh, Essential is going to be around. Motorola typically does a pretty good job with this. Um, and uh, I don't think they do a good job anymore. They well yeah so so I'm thinking specifically of the Android One versions of their phones that doesn't count it's uh, not available everywhere which comes what do you mean it's not available everywhere you can buy it unlocked it's not really available yeah. everywhere um are you talking about outside of the U S yeah or and in the U S oh. and everywhere okay yeah 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 um but yeah so so my solution to this problem of uh, not getting software updates is immediately when I when I get a non-pixel phone i will take it uh i will wipe away the uh the operating system that comes on it and i will install lineage os on it um and that way like the updates are coming not from the company that doesn't have any financial incentive to continue to update the software on this thing but it is coming from a community who also don't have financial incentive but they do have the incentive of they use these devices as well. And so if you have somebody who, uh, you know, is motivated enough to make a build of the latest version of Android for your phone, then you're good to go and you get the update. Um, And so at that point, you just need to make sure that you have a phone that is fairly popular enough, uh, you know, for there to be people who are going to uh, make a a current build. Um, Who want to continue to use it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And Project Treble, um, which was introduced in Android 8, is has done a, a really fantastic uh, thing for, for the modding, or the, for the ROM community, because um, now they don't have to worry about uh, recreating drivers from scratch. Um, so they, they can just, you know, make one build of Lineage OS, and that can go on any device that already has, like, um, a version of Android that is 8 or newer. Yeah. Yeah, everything you described is why I have an iPhone because I just don't have time for that. I want my phone to work. (laughs) I want my phone to get updates. And that is one thing that Steve Jobs figured out how to do is say, carriers, nope, we're, we're, we're taking care of software updates. You have no hand in it. And that's Mm -hmm. like, it, it's always going to work. It's always going to be up to date. Um, and for the longest time, I didn't I didn't understand why it was such an issue on on phones uh, on Android phones, because like I came from using a Windows computer and then using a Nexus Seven tablet, right. and you know so like I I could not comprehend the concept of oh 
Verizon has to like test and approve this new version of the operating system before it's allowed to be pushed out to devices. I was like, wait, what? No, the the updates are supposed to come from Google, and you know the carrier shouldn't have anything to do with this. Like my Wi-Fi, my my internet provider doesn't have to approve new versions of Windows before I install them on my computer. That's absurd. Right. Um, but there's also but not a proprietary radio using proprietary network technologies allegedly in your Windows computer. Yeah, maybe we should um, not do that anymore. Maybe we should, well, maybe yeah, maybe we should like make these technologies uh, open. Hmm. You never, you hmm. never, never. You can't, you can't do that. that this is America. Yeah. Even when there's a standard like Doxus three for modems, Comcast will still say, "Hey, that modem won't work on our network." Because yeah, we don't yeah. sell it, right? So I don't know. That's my view of Verizon saying your phone can be on our network and we need to control the updates. Mm-hmm. But you know, so mm-hmm. maybe we should talk about like some lower end phones too. So, okay. what like what 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 has been the cheapest smartphone any of you have had? Uh, me personally, any of you? I would say the Nexus Five. Yeah, that was it, a good one. When yep. it came out, probably a year, but at, around that time, it was still an expensive phone. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, what was the Nexus Five? Either four hundred dollars or five hundred. I think yeah. it was four hundred. Yeah, four hundred. That, that was actually the very first cell phone that I ever owned. Yeah, that was my second cell phone that I really owned. I remember when I ordered it, I was taking a uh, geology class at the U, and I ran out of class and sat down, connected to Wi-Fi, and hit buy. Uh, very important, you know. Um, <laughs> So my cheapest phones have been the iPhone tied between iPhone four, five, six. <laughs> I don't know if the seven was fifty dollars more or less. And I've always done the <laughs> not the baseline storage, but the one up from that. So I had the thirty two gig iPhone four and a thirty two gig iPhone five and then a uh sixty four gig iPhone six and a one twenty eight gig iPhone seven. Yeah, I wonder how much the Nexus four costs because I had that was that three ninety nine or something? Yeah, I don't know. I have been very close to, you know, somebody who is using a Moto G3 for a long time. My dad has had his Moto G3. Um, I don't remember how long ago we bought it, but that was like a $200, $230 phone, I think, because we got the 32 gig version instead of 16. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's serving him pretty well. So in, in the phone market, there's sort of this weird, weird thing that has been going on where a while ago, there was sort of this really big boom in the... 200 to 300 dollar range and now it's sort of died down again and now there's a big boom in the 400 to 600 dollar range and another separate big boom in the thousand dollar range um <laughs> and so now there are some really awful phones again in the 200 hundred dollar range where they're they're running um chips and made out of materials that are very subpar to what was uh, hanging around relatively just recently hmm yeah, and um, what Aaron said about about me worrying about software updates applies to me listening to Ryan talk about hardware because I can't keep track of like <laughs> what what different um, you know processors are are where in their product lineups for you know all of these because di- there, there's a lot of different. Um, I mean, there there are more processor vendors in the mobile space than there are in the desktop space. While true, um, there's also surprisingly few relevant vendors in the mobile space. Y- yes, yes. You basically have Qualcomm and Apple and Samsung. Yeah. I guess I I, I came to Android because of its integration with with Google services, but like I I've stayed because it's an open platform. Um, you know, it's I I. I don't think I would be able to stand using a, a a device where like I can only buy the apps from the manufacturer of that device. Um, even you know, even though I don't like play most of the like games that I have bought from Humble Bundles, just like you know, knowing that I can take all of my software and have it like be free of DRM uh, on Android is like. A huge load off my chest. I think um, something going forward in the future is, you know, how do we archive all of these old apps that mm-hmm. no longer run anymore because they're all locked into proprietary things? And I don't know if that's going to be possible or maybe way in the future someone will emulate iOS or Android. 
but well android i think is way easier to do that with for sure mm -hmm. yeah we'll see especially but, you know if you already have the apks that you know you just keep those in a file in a folder somewhere yeah but i i mean i think i i came to iowa or iphone because it was um it at the time i was you know using a macbook but it wasn't quite the same ecosystem as it was today it was before iCloud I was never a mobile me subscriber but um it was just kind of the next step logically for me and then I kind of stayed because those iPhones have gotten so fast I think they're still a couple of years ahead of the Android phones in terms of raw performance um even usable performance um I think the design style of iOS is, is great you get software support for now six years of running the latest software on an iPhone um, their security, I think, is is much better than Android, especially on a like per device basis. Yeah, um, I I would like to publicly shame Google here on the like um, software support side. You know, they 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 introduced Project Trouble last year, and I thought, oh, okay, this is perfect. You know, they they're they're not going to have to rely on Qualcomm to come out with drivers for the uh, processors. So like Google will be able to keep updating their own devices for as long as they, uh, as long as they think that that's important. And apparently they think that it's important for three years, which is like absurd, right? They, they took their two years software support and bumped it up to three. Ooh, my gosh. Uh, and I've heard on average, most are supported for maybe just a year and a half. Right. Yeah. No, I'm talking just specifically about the pixel line. Um, yeah. I also, I have a really funny preference when it comes to phones. Um, I definitely have gotten myself hooked on Project Fi um, as, as a carrier. Um, now, to be clear, like any, any phones that I buy from Project Fi are like unlocked. I, I don't have to keep them on Project Fi. I can just switch them to a different carrier. Um, but like Project Fi is such a good deal for the amount of money that you're spending um, and the amount of coverage that you get that like, that like I d don't think that I would really like having a phone that isn't, you know, one of like the handful of phones that is um approved like, you know, that is fully compatible with with Project Fi. Um I can take my Project Fi SIM and put it into any unlocked phone that I want, but uh then it only uses T-Mobile's network, which, you know, defeats half of the purpose of me being on Project Fi. I find Fi's data plan still far too expensive to be worth it. Yeah, well, I don't use much data, so like I'm typically spending thirty to thirty-five dollars per month on when I'm on Fi. Yeah, it's too much. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's the, it's the exact same amount of money that I was spending on T-Mobile, but yeah, I get but I, far I far far better coverage. To, I don't I don't go anywhere. I live here. I have fine coverage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do we want to talk about smartwatches? I don't know. What time is it? Time to get a watch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, what I can, can we really say about smartwatches, really? I think it's it's really down to the Apple Watch is, is pretty much dominating all in terms of a smartwatch, unless you maybe count a Fitbit as a smartwatch, which... Uh, don't do it line. don't do it yeah there there are some fitbits that you can count as a smartwatch um yeah. but you know yeah not all fitbits i think nothing nothing is quite on the same scale as the apple watch um and i think apple is definitely pushing that and they have the ecosystem that supports a featured and actively developed on smart watch yep um i think android gear or android wear is it's called wear os now wear os yes it's <laughs> wear i remember aware. when it when it first came out, I saw a few of those in the wild. I haven't seen any in years now. I think it's, it, to me, it seems like it's kind of fizzled away. Oh, it certainly has. Um, let's ask Qualcomm to see how it's doing. Oh, uh, I'm pretty sure that brand ran out of time. So Yeah, I I mean, I when it comes to smartwatches, I think it's very important to have a watch that can, that isn't going to further tie you into whatever mobile ecosystem you're in, right? So, like, I even if I had an iPhone, I wouldn't be buying an Apple Watch because, um, you know, it it wouldn't work on uh, any other phone. 
Now, that being said, that I don't think there are any really smart watches that, like, work on Windows Phone or, like, does BlackBerry even still exist? What's Windows Phone? What's BlackBerry? It's, it's just iOS and Android at this point. So, um, yeah, it's... I... I <laughs> I'm really happy with my Pebble that I still have that I bought like two or three years ago. And um, and even though it's not like the, the company doesn't exist anymore, right? So that like I, I don't have any support in terms of like getting it repaired. Once the battery, you know, uh, degrades enough, like that's it. I probably won't be able to use it anymore. Um, but the Pebble just like it ticks all of those boxes that that I mentioned way at the beginning. It, you know, it's it's an open platform. It works on on both Android and iOS. Um, the hardware itself, like you can like Pebble doesn't prevent people from going and installing uh, other like, you know, you can wipe the operating system. You can install whatever you want on it. Um, it's not nearly as straightforward, of course, as like doing that on a desktop. But, you know, that's that's the nature of, of the it being a watch. Um they they even you know were like um they had this concept of of like third party watch bands that people could could build that could have other sensors built into them or you know whatever and it could interface with the pebble um and uh and i i just i don't think that we've seen that in any other um smartwatch device no uh, and there's some technical no. reasons why that's happened right so it's very difficult for any of these smartwatches to have good hardware unless somehow mm-hmm. they get Qualcomm to deliver them good hardware, which is impossible, unless right. you're Apple and you can make your own chips. And then, if that wasn't enough, most of the processing is still done on the phone anyway. So that means you have to have deep ties into the operating system to get a lot of the good data and seamless connectivity and to have platform delivery and so on and so forth. And so it's very difficult for an Android watch to compete on iOS when iOS will certainly never let Android do anything at the core level. And it's very hard for a, uh, an Apple watch to do anything on Android because Android has no clue what to do. Ever. Well, no, I I would like to say that Android actually like allows any peripherals to to access like most of the parts of the operating system if you if you let them, right? Um like if Pebble had decided to go and come out with a model that had like higher end hardware, they could have done almost all of the same integrations as Wear OS had. Um, they just would have had to build it themselves instead of you know getting right. the operating system and, straight from and Google. And it's possible that um, they would have had to splinter their own ecosystem, which would have probably right, been right, right, even right. worse for them. Um, but no, like like with this with this Pebble watch, which like cost me ninety dollars, um, you know, I'm able to get all of my notifications on my watch. Uh, I can reply to any messages that come from you know apps like um, Hangouts or Inbox or whatever. Um, you know, it, it it can forward all of its uh, step counting data to Google Fit. Um, yeah, like. Like, it, there was there, there's even this great uh, third party app that I installed for the Pebble that will monitor my phone for Google Maps notifications, and it'll put like that turn by turn. You know what is what is your next turn in your navigation on my watch, um, which was fantastic when I was biking around before I had a uh, a mount for my phone. Um, so that I could actually see like what I was about to do uh, there on my watch, and I think that like ironically, having really low end hardware in the Pebble is actually like one of the things that is making it giving it a lot of longevity for me um, because I I am not. Like I bought this thing knowing that it wouldn't be able to do everything that like an, an Android Wear uh, or a a Wear OS. Watch OS, whatever iOS calls theirs. Apple, ah, <laughs> words. Watch OS. Watch OS, yes. Um, like, I knew that it wasn't going to be able to do everything that a more expensive smartwatch could do. And because of that, I have never, ever missed, like, oh, look, the new Apple Watch has come out and it can now, like, alert the authorities if I fall over and can't get up, um, right? Or, or 
I I don't know. I don't even know what like new things uh, Apple Watches can do because like yeah, I'm just I'm happy with what I've got, and I don't mind that like the hardware is. I think this thing is running on like a Texas Instruments, you know, like calculator processor, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Yeah, I certainly don't pay enough attention to the Android world to know exactly what I may may or may not be missing out on. But <laughs> you know, ignorance is bliss too. So. Yeah. Uh, so about watches, like I never wore a watch up until the Apple watch, um, just because I thought they were bulky. Uh, even when I went out and exercise, rode, uh, rode my bike, you know, all sorts of activities that I would want to track, uh, like what a Fitbit would do or what some sort of wearable device would do. Um, I think the, you know, if you take out who made it, um, and look at the platform of like a smart watch in general, because I don't think we're at a point in time where wearables are really good yet, but mm-hmm. I think there's a use case for them, right? Like um, the, the falling down thing, I, f- I find that very kind of funny in, in a way, but I want that. So when I go ride my mountain bike solo in the woods, no one knows exactly where I am, except I'm on a trail but if I actually have an accident and I'm not responsive, that that use case is just blows my mind for like technology, like that type of thing. It, it could be built into my phone or like something on my bike. I really like the the watch as like a, a wearable device. Um, I think it's a platform that you know, just like you, the way you're talking about a Pebble, you're really passionate about what it can do for you. Um, it just doesn't you don't want to tie to a particular platform. Right. I think if we can get there in a couple of years where we're not waiting on like a Qualcomm to say, Oh, well, yeah, here's a chip to do it. That's the, that's the, like the downfall of wearables right now is we're waiting on uh, technology, I guess. Mm-hmm. And that's in contrast to like the home automation uh, arena where the the thing that's really holding us back is software. Um, The biggest issue is like, you know, you can't buy certain things because they just won't interact with other parts of like this system that you're building. And so, yeah, like we're we're still in in the infancy of of smart home stuff. yeah, we and, are. and right, yeah, and right now, I think that the the most important thing that you can look at when choosing like which smart thermostat to buy or like which you know uh, smart lights to buy is just like will it gracefully integrate with the other parts, the other things that you are also buying? Um, yeah. yeah, I know the answer to that. <laughs> it's the no. other thing that it's no, yeah. but. <laughs> The other thing that I look at when I'm considering like smart home stuff is um, not like it's not actually related to any of the hardware or like, you know, anything like that. It's literally related to is it meant to do something that is actually going to be useful in my life? Right. Um, Because so many of these things are just like it's a gimmick. But like, um, you know, a smart thermostat is a great example of something that can actually save me money because it is turning off the heater when there's nobody at home. Um, a, a uh, you know, an automated uh, robotic like vacuum can actually do a task for me that I would normally have to do as a chore while I'm just gone from the home. Um, automatic window blinds can open when you wake up to let in the light and then when you leave for work closed so the sun doesn't heat up your house. And then when you get uh-huh. home, open again so you see out your windows. Yeah. And they can turn off all the lights when your phone leaves the vicinity of your building. Yep. There's a lot of fun use cases. It's just if they would all work together. And in, and they're mm-hmm. really expensive generally. Like yes. getting those Hue light bulbs, I mean, it's like, what, $40 a light bulb, which is a little bit too expensive for me. Yeah. And I can buy three phones a year, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they're not quite forty dollars, but they've come down quite a bit. Thirty five ninety nine. <laughs> okay. All right. I think uh, I think we pretty well covered uh, most of the electronics that one might consider buying. Um, 
fellas, where can people find you on the internet? Let's have our guests go first. Uh, oh, you can find me on Twitter at 8 Aaron. That's about it. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me. And of course, you can find me, Ryan, just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at RyanMar, and of course, on my website, ryanrampersad.com. You can find me on uh, Mastodon. I've been trying to use that a lot more recently uh, at Ian R. Buck at mastodon.cloud. Um, or I suppose my woefully underused website, ianrbuck.com. <laughs> Did you lose the lottery again? I may have, you know. It's, nope, you're up. It's a problem. You're up. You're fine. You're good. <laughs> the Extra Dimension is a production of the Nexus TV. We are a network of technology-focused podcasts. You can find our other shows at thenexus.tv. The Extra Dimension is released under a Creative Commons attribution license, so feel free to take any part of the show and do anything that you want with it, as long as you link back to the original page, which is thenexus.tv slash TED37. If you would like to discuss this episode with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at r slash thenexustv. And if you would like to help support us financially as we make more educational, technology-focused podcasts, please go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash TV. And remember that no matter where you're listening to this, you should definitely go and subscribe to The Extra Dimension in your favorite podcast player so you can get all the new episodes as soon as they're created. Until next time, have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological technological convergence. Convergence. Tech news is dominated by big announcements with big, bombastic personalities. Developers! 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 Sometimes they make us laugh. Yes, I'd like to order 4,000 lattes to go, please. Sometimes we laugh at them. Courage. Sometimes we're filled with awe. There it is. Oh! Check that out. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. They never want us to forget. Remember? That the show's never over because... I got one more thing. Now, it's often difficult to make the journey to see these events live. This is a freaking dirt road! Oh my god! (laughs) But we here at the Nexus TV have got you covered. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. So come join us as we explore the brave new worlds that await us. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today.